So welcome to We're Not Really Here and Pep Guardiola and his squad have travelled all the way down to the south coast. St Mary's and Southampton welcome Manchester City and Fernandinho. What of six changes for Manchester City in this Premier League match this evening, the final one of the weekend. And for City after that stunning 4-0 victory over Liverpool. The champions were crowned, but Manchester City laid down a marker. Yes, indeed, on Thursday night, potentially for much, much more as well. And some 220 miles away, here we are in our rather stunning studio at the Etihad Stadium. We're not really here, we're not really there, but we are at least joined by Mr. Paul Dickov and Mr. Michael Brown and a rather impressive golden boot, you'll notice. And yes, there has been a golden boot winner on this sofa before and there is one again as well through Paul Dickov. We also have Natalie Pavlek who's been looking at the teams and Natalie tell us a little bit about what Pep's done because he has rung the changes. It is only just 72 hours since City played Liverpool of course. Yeah, thank you very much, Hugh. Yes, we're looking at a team with six changes from that incredible win on just Thursday night. Edison starts in goal. And then we've got changes on the right and the left of a back four. You have Cancelo, Laporte, Garcia and Zinchenko. Moving on into midfield, it is Fernandinho back, we think, we are guessing, in his favourite holding midfield position. And nobody here in the studio can remember the last time that we saw him playing in that position, so we're all very excited. We also see starts for both the Silvers, so David and Bernardo. We're expecting them to play in the middle of that midfield. And then uh, changes out there on the right with Mares starting, on the left Sterling, and then playing up front again is Gabriel Jesus, who of course has some incredible memories from the goal he scored at St. Mary's when we clinched that 100 points two years ago. So that's your starting 11. The subs for today on the bench, you've got Bravo, John Stones, Gundawan, Rodri, Kevin De Bruyne, Otamendi, Phil Foden, and then you've got Tommy Doyle and Taylor Harwood Bellis. So that is your full squad for today. Thanks, you. Uh, Natalie, thank you very much indeed. So let's start with the holding midfielder alongside us on our rather glamorous sofa, and that is, of course, Michael Brown. Michael Fernandinho, we don't think, has played at all this season as a holding midfielder that the previous, what, 34 years of his life was very much his position. So can he remember what it's like, and how much more running is he going to have to do? He's going to do a lot more <laughs> running, that's for sure. These central defenders get away with it. Those midfield runners, runners have got to do all the work. Sometimes you don't get full credit for it, but he's the master at it. He's the uh, so such a perfectionist. I love watching him play in that role. Such an unselfish player. He sees teammates have got so much respect for him. And now, obviously, Rodri's trying to follow in that role, to learn from him. But I'm looking forward to seeing that midfield three. Really, really, you know, got a bit of craft, a bit of energy. So it should be a good one. Uh, yes, and uh, Fernandinho back after suspension, of course, didn't get to the, an opportunity to play on Thursday night in that extraordinary night. Uh, but, Paul, six changes is kind of understandable. If you think about the pre pre previous period, short period that Pep had between two games since uh, the restart, he did pretty much that. I think he did seven that time. So understandable that he should think about making sure that he regenerates as much as possible. Yeah, it's all about keeping players fresh. Um, you know, six changes have been made, but you look at the team, it's still a very, very strong team, you know, and... David Silva coming in, Bernardo Silva, and um, Riyad Mahrez coming back in, who's been outstanding all season. So it's, it's still a strong team, and you know, like Brownie, I'm looking forward to seeing Fernandinho back in there. But also Gabriel Jesus getting his chance again. You know, he's he's come in for a little bit of stick at times, but he's, he, his goals per minute when he plays is, is ridiculous, you know, and he's, he's still only 23. It's been hard for him because obviously Sergio Aguero has obviously been the main man for such a long time, and he's had to bide his time, but he's got a fantastic attitude, and he seems to score every time he plays. Uh, yes, it is a seven o'clock kick kickoff on the South Coast. If you remember a couple of years ago, Gabriel Jesus scored that goal that got the 100 points. It was a very sunny day on that occasion in May. We're in July, of course, and it's just as sunny uh, on the South Coast. If you're watching us from Manchester, you'll appreciate that the four seasons in one day cliche has very much uh, happened today. Everywhere and anywhere that you're watching us, you are very welcome. Uh, and we will be here right up until uh, seven o'clock at halftime and indeed post-match as well with the team that we have here. But without further ado, let's hear from Pep Guardiola ahead of this one against Southampton. Pep, six changes from the win over Liverpool. Was that a necessity given the quick turnaround from Thursday's game? Yeah, we play every three games, every three days. Uh, a lot of games uh, ahead. And 
and all the players deserve to play for the way they behave and their training and they play. It was a big win against Liverpool. You've just said the way they're behaving, the way they're training, the way they're playing. How impressed are you with the way they've all come back since the restart? Uh, not bad. Even the game when we lost against Chelsea, we, we performed quite well. Uh, but it's the past, so now we have we need four more points to qualify for the Champions League next season, and especially the game, the semi-finals against Arsenal in Madrid. Southampton themselves looked really good since the restart as well. What are you expecting from them today? What are you I'm making really from them? I'm really impressed after an incredible tough moment they, they, they suffered with when they lost 0-9 mm here -hmm. against Leicester. Since then, the approach was incredible, aggressive, and and uh, I know Ralph from 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 Germany. I was when I was in Bayern Munich, and uh, and I know now his team, the way they play and the quality. Always Southampton has a has and had a, an, an a good 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 uh, good players, and they make an incredible run of victories and results, and they are. Uh, out of the, you know, the dangerous position and thinking, thinking uh, in a top top positions. And finally, a word on David Silver. It's ten years this week since he joined the club. He captains the side today. Do we just have to enjoy him for as long as we can? He's absolutely legend. So ten years for uh, not for everyone, but the foreign player especially for his quality, sustain or survive in this league is not not easy. That. That means the mentality of uh, of the beat. I think all the guys who stay 10 years, 12 years, 15 years in this league is because they are mentally prepared, ready. The quality, what what should we say? <laughs> so is a is an exceptional player, and of course it's the last games and. And he's going to, you know, to enjoy uh, his uh, last moments in England. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Pat. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that's uh, Pep Guardiola uh, ahead of this one against Southampton. There you go, proof uh, that the sun is shining uh, on St Mary's this evening for this 7 o'clock kickoff. If you are watching and enjoying us on the Manchester City app, you'll be able to enjoy commentary uh, during the game as well. I mentioned we had a golden boot, so we should now give Paul Dickov the opportunity to say that he was at one point in his career a golden boot winner. I've stopped goal scorer a few times. I don't know about the <laughs> overall golden boots um, winner, but no, um, I've got a few of them. Put them on every now and then as well. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad they fit. <laughs> like Cinderella, yeah, if, the, if the slipper fits. Michael, any opportunities for you to, to, to kind of crow about goal-scoring exploits? I don't think that was always my game. As everybody <laughs> knows, that apart from one season at Sheffield United, I did manage to score 22. So I think I used them all up in one season, Hugh. From midfield? From midfield, I do See, say. mark that, Mr Dickov. From <laughs> midfield, which by the end of your career, you're pretty much a midfielder anyway. So you were still banging them at that point. So Fullback, I think I ended <laughs> yes, up back exactly. there at one point. Just, just an opportunity to be on the field would do anyway. Uh, Natalie has the two teams we've had about Manchester City. Uh, what about Southampton? Let's get the full lineups from Natalie. Yes, thank you, Hugh. We do. We have the lineup now for Southampton. Southampton, who have lost their last six Premier League meetings against City. Let's hope I haven't jinxed it there. The Southampton team for today is in goal, McCarthy, Walker Peters, Bednarik, Stevens, and Bertrand. You then have, looking up into midfield, Ward Prowse, Romeu, Armstrong, Redmond, and then we think up front will be Shea Adams and Danny Ings, who of course we mentioned is third in the race for the Golden Boot at the minute, just behind Vardy and Aubameyang. Over to you, Hugh. Uh, Natalie, thank you very much indeed. We'll talk about Southampton in just a moment, but I, I want to reflect um, just quickly on what Pep Guardiola, Pep Guardiola said there um, to the BBC commentary team. And that, that, Michael, is very interesting because he did make reference to the fact that they went from Chelsea to Liverpool, which was quite a turnaround. But prior to Chelsea, Manchester City had been playing really well. So what do we learn from that? Do we learn that, that Liverpool was the anomaly or that Chelsea was the anomaly? And actually, we expect more of the Liverpool than we do the Chelsea performance tonight against Southampton. Well, you'd certainly hope we see more of that Liverpool performance. And, and, and they didn't really perform as well as you'd have liked at Chelsea. We know that, but what a reaction. The pressure was on. Obviously, the new crown champions with such a strong team. And what was impressed me as well is that you, you, that you was, he put Garcia in, he put Phil Ford in to get them opportunities. And, and wow, didn't they do well? So it was a wonderful performance. And I think that will have really lifted spirits around the place to, to put Liverpool right back in their place. So fantastic. But now it's about the prep, the loading, building. And this is an important game. But it's, again, it's about the semi-final and getting up to speed ready for those Champions League games as well. I'm fascinated that Eric Garcia and Eric Laporte 
both start again, Paul. They were against a Liverpool side who have scored plenty of goals, not quite as many as Manchester City, but plenty of goals in this um, stellar season for them, that Eric Garcia was the one that he called upon because he said afterwards, essentially, he does not make mistakes. And given what happened at Chelsea, that was interesting that he should say that. Yeah, it was. And, you know, Eric Garcia, for somebody so young, he, he plays as if he's got a lot more experience and a lot more games under his belt. And, you know, I've been really impressed with him. I'll go back to a couple of seasons ago when we were um, in the US pre-season and he played against Dortmund as a 16-year-old, I think he was then. And he didn't look out of place at all, you know. And every time he's been called on, he's, he's looked excellent. He's very composed. He reads the game very well. And we all know that Pep wants his centre-halves and all his defenders to be able to play out for the back. And he's so comfortable at doing that as well. And having somebody like Laporte alongside him who's been... He's been outstanding, you know. You can't say that one player, you miss one player that makes a team. Um, but I just, I keep saying if you take somebody like Van Dijk at a Liverpool's team, there's going to be a huge hole, and I think that's happened with, with Laporte. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating because uh, Eric Garcia is actually younger than Phil Foden and we've been talking, haven't we, all about uh, Phil Foden being just incredibly young. Well, uh, Garcia is a year younger uh, than that. So let's talk about uh, the, the game this evening and, and Southampton. It's been an extraordinary time for them uh, and I think Pep Guardiola mentioned it, didn't he, Paul, that you've got this 9-0 crazy against one of your former sides, Leicester, crazy defeat on the copybook and yet since then they have reacted, they have done well, they are safe, they have played incredibly incredibly well away from home, abysmally at home, and that 9-0 uh, was at home. But they are safe, and they've got Ralph Huston Hudel on a new four-year contract, so they clearly see their, their future with him. Pep's played against him in Bundesliga over the years, so they seem settled. They've just got to sort out this home form, haven't they? Yeah, they have, but I think everybody at Southampton's got to take a lot of credit, because there was a lot of calls for um, Ralph to get sacked after that 9-0 game, and, and rightly so. Um, but they've stuck by him, gave him his new contract, and you know, since the restart, away from home, as we know, they're very good. They've been great. And um, Danny Ings, Natalie was saying before, you know, he's on fire at the minute and he'll be a real handful for us. We're talking about Laporte and Garcia. Danny Ings is, is someone I've watched for a long, long time. You know, he's, he's come through the lower leagues. He's had a lot of injuries, but he's hunger there to do to do well. He's, he's for everybody to see, he was on the brink of an England call-up as well. So, it's, you know, I fully expect Man City to be comfortable tonight, but... Southampton, we've got threats all over the pitch, so it's going to be difficult. Uh, yeah, and they haven't changed their formation. They haven't put any extra defenders in their side. They're, they're sticking with their, it's almost old-fashioned, 4-4-2, but it's a kind of a 4-2-2-2 uh, that he likes to call upon. Uh, you just saw pictures of Ralph Hasenhutl and, of course, uh, Danny Ings, who, who starts up front. We can't say that Southampton's poor home form has anything to do with post-lockdown having no fans because it was poor before the lockdown, but it's an extraordinary reversal of what you would normally assume a team would ha have any sort of statistics would tell you it doesn't work that way. Well, you would think, especially getting beat 9 0, do you think it'd be a team who are quite sort of soft, no real underbelly, but to come and get results away from home in the Premier League, that's some statement. So they are a threat. I think, as you said, is those wide players come inside a lot, which will help them against the Manchester City side who generally do well in the midfield areas. So it's a big ask. But Shea Adams also, I've, I've watched his career closely come through. A strong lad, he could be, right when you talk about Garcia, a real you know, powerful guy who's going to be right up against him. So that's one to watch. He'd be wanting his opportunity. There's been talk about him moving. And Danny Ings lost that. I was at Leicester City yesterday and watched Jamie Vardy go get his 100th goal. So the pressure's back on. But what, what a competition for him to go and chase also. Uh, yeah, ever since Danny Ings went top of those goal-scoring charts, the other two that are up there with him decided to bang the goals in thereafter. Um, uh, we'll talk about uh, but a very, very famous Manchester City against Southampton game in just a moment. There's certainly a, a big memory from this guy to my right. But first of all, let's hear from a guy we've just been talking about, Eric Garcia. Eric, the Premier League season is quickly coming to an end. The title is gone, but what are the aims now for the team for the rest of the season? Well, we still have some games to play left, and then we have the semi-finals of, of the FAA against Arsenal, so I think these games are really good for us to, to prepare for, for what's coming. Also, we have the, the Champions League in August, so it's always good to, to have games to prepare for, for big games that are coming up. What is the mood like in the dressing room, especially after that big win against Liverpool? I think the mood is, is really well. Obviously, the, the win against Liverpool helped, but anyway, apart from it, uh, we won against Newcastle, so we went through the FA. We have, as I said, big things coming up, so the mood is, is really well. And in the reverse fixture, Southampton ran you very close. What are you expecting from them today? Well, we always know that coming here is, is really tough. They, they have a great side. They've improved massively recently, so we expect a tough game. 
And finally, Pep's shown that he's not afraid to put young players like yourself in the team. How much are you enjoying the opportunities that you're getting personally at the moment? Well, I'm really happy for, for the opportunity, but I need to keep working hard to show him that confidence that, that he's given me, that I can, I can prove it on the, on the field. And you had that nasty clash in the first game. How are you feeling from, from then? That all over in the past yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, all over in the past. <laughs> Brilliant. Best of luck Thank today. You. Thank you. Uh, Eric Garcia on We're Not Really Here. And uh, even squinting Pep Guardiola, such as the sunshine on the south coast at the moment. A seven o'clock kickoff, just about 45 minutes away. It is Southampton against Manchester City. And Michael Brown, who's sat alongside me with Paul Dickoff and Natalie Pavlek, of course, with us here on We're Not Really Here as well. I'm going to throw you back to 1996, just before a diminutive Scottish striker joined Manchester City, which I know was the most important thing that happened in 1996. But Georgie Kinkladze and a famous goal against uh, for Manchester City against Southampton, which is very interesting because you were, you were at the club at the time. Now, you were very young, and not a lot of us remember everything that we did when we were teenagers, but still, you can't quite remember whether you were actually involved in the game, watching from the bench, or just watching. No, I was either I was I was definitely <laughs> watching it from the sidelines. So I was either on the bench or just behind watching it. My squad didn't make it or whatever it was. I was maybe 17, 18 years of age and I just remember him picking the ball up and, and we always knew what ability he had. You see it daily in training, try to get him and then literally he starts going on his journey, literally riding one challenge after another, and you see the clips now, and just the balance and sheer agility that he had, and this was brilliant, and Dave Besson become a coach at Fulham, I used to remind him why he sat down, how come you sat down that day, Dave, what happened to you, well you're supposed to stand up as a goalkeeper, he's telling his keepers to stand up, and he didn't, but it was just a, a wonderful goal, and, and, and this is what he possesses, that balance, and I used to try and obviously kick a few of my teammates every now and then in training. With Georgie, he had such a low centre of gravity, you couldn't take it off him. He'd move it another way. He was really, really a class football. He should have went on and done a bit better. Uh, yeah, that's why they called him the Georgie Maradona, because he had all those people diving in trying to get the ball off him, and nobody ever got anywhere near him at that point. No, I used to try and kick him every day in training, <laughs> exactly, and it was so frustrating go. because you couldn't get anywhere near him. And Brownie will tell you, he's, he's probably the only player I've played with or trained with that could not make you when you had your legs closed. You know, he was that good and used to chase after him. They just had that but, knack but of giving Paul, the ball how, away. So, how strong yeah. was he, mate? Do you he know, was. like, literally, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think it. was a small guy, but he just his balance and thick set. He's really, really strong. Well, you have to do that to ride the challenges, don't you? Because otherwise, <laughs> you, you've got a low sense of gravity. <laughs> That's say, taken Paul, away. Paul, you go that way and I'll get him from the other <laughs> yeah. side. Quick, we're going to win this today. That happened a few times, by the way, as well. Don't worry about that. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds <laughs> familiar. And Natalie, you remember that, uh, that game and that goal very, very well. And it wasn't the only goal that he scored of note for Manchester City as well. Yeah, I started supporting City in 1993. I didn't get my first season ticket until 1998. And before that, we were only allowed to go. We could only afford to go to sort of one or two games. So I wasn't at that Southampton game. And back then, people watching this might not remember an era before the internet, uh, before anything. To, to find out scores, you had to watch CFAX if you weren't there, or indeed wait for match of the day. Um, so I remember watching it afterwards and everybody talking about it in school the next day. And Georgie Kinklatsi, for me, was the first incredible player that I watched live regularly um, and you can still watch him now and, and still appreciate his absolute and utter natural talent the, the the effortless ability that that man possessed and he just seemed to glide past players and with a ball glued to his feet you know that old cliche really really um, applies to Georgie and King Klatsy. so he was like I say the first truly incredible player um, that I ever watched and I'm very lucky now that we get to watch lots of incredible players regularly because back then it certainly wasn't that way uh, yeah not actually players Thanks, like that now she just has nightmares <laughs> thinking back on the time but there is there is that strange kind of anachronism to Georgie King Klatsy. he is a player that's why he's called the Georgian Marathon Madonna because it was of that era you don't really see players like that even with all the skills that these players display it's 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 slightly more physical yes they might have a low center of gravity like somebody like Bernardo Silva does but it's the way that the game is you don't have players diving in you don't have players who go around those diving in challenges it's more structured it's more disciplined and it's almost a bit of a shame that because you don't have those defenders making all the poor decisions you don't get those dribblers to sometimes make fools of them absolutely I'd love to see George Georgia play now where defenders can't tackle and it's a lot more because um, we played the games with Georgia that you could tell in the first five ten minutes that all the opposition team wanted to do was take him out of the game you know they would get man marked they would try and kick him they would swap it around somebody would get booked they would put somebody else on him to try and kick him as well and just take him out of the game but um, he was as well as being super talented he was a really good lad as well wasn't he Brownie and you know for somebody coming in um, 
he could be a little so and so at times. You know, he, he was one of these. He, he would speak English when he wanted to speak English, and then all of a sudden not understand the word you yeah, were saying. He, could, at times play, he could play that what, one for a Whatever he wanted to do, yeah, whatever he wanted to do to get away with it. He understands everything. He still does that now. He still comes to games as he says. Not so sure I understand that, but he does. He, he, understand, he understood everything. everything. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you could say it's politeness, you could say it's shyness, or either he's having us all on, which might be... Yeah, he, is, he is shy, actually. No, he, he is. He just likes to keep himself to himself. But you just think of the, the talent, and it was such a shame, and you talk about the players today, he had the similar ability. He would have joined in this side. He would have seen a, a real special player. He's probably just the, the wrong era for him. Uh, yeah, it was a, a, an era where you had players like that that were described as luxuries, weren't they? And funnily enough, a, a playing against Georgie Kinklazi that day for Southampton was Matt Letizia, another player who was considered a luxury. And it was an, a, a, a Manchester City manager in Alan Ball that gave him the ability to express himself at Southampton. And also, he gave Georgie Kinklazi the opportunity to express himself at Manchester City. That's right. He was a bit of a luxury, but uh, did people like me and Brownie that used to do all these running for him, that, that, that was why. But, but we didn't mind doing that. There's, so there's we, always collateral damage. We didn't mind doing that. And, you know, if you spoke to us saying George is a great lad, and if, if you spoke to George now, he would probably slightly regret the way that his careers went. You know, when he went to Ajax, he had a lot of top clubs in England, Liverpool at the time, um, were wanting to sign him. And he possibly felt as if he took the easy way out a little bit. You know, he, he was a big fish here. Um, so going to Ajax, he was out the line a little bit more. And... He'll admit himself, he, he should have went on and done being a top, top player, um, not just not just in England, but in Europe. Yeah, it's uh, wonderful to look back on uh, some of those goals uh, that he scored. There were plenty, but it is always that one uh, that for, for Natalie, just on that day on CFAX, seeing King Cladsey scores a goal, doesn't really tell you the whole story, does it? When it just says one word, King Cladsey, and the minute of the goal, uh, there's so much more besides. So I, I'm just wondering if we've been speaking about Georgie, Georgie King Cladsey and some wonderful goals, I just wonder if it's time to look back on some other rather extraordinary goals from Thursday night. Have we, have we waited long enough to do that? I could just say the appetite being wetted. I think we've got to run them, we've got to show them, surely we've got them to see them all over again. I mean, it's just, it was brilliant performance, wasn't it? Phil Foden, and it's just, just for him to get on the score sheet again and really step up. And, and I was asked, I was, I was at another game, I was at the Sheffield United game actually, and, and we were discussing him on Five Live regarding what Phil Foden can bring, self and Dion Dublin, regarding this game. How big will he be? Is he ready for it? Do you think Manchester City, Joe, will feel free to, to release him? Well, they did. I said, don't worry about him. He'll, be, he'll play well. He'll be fantastic. But I said he needed his teammates to help him on the night. And I think they did. We've seen others step up. Kevin De Bruyne, a remarkable performance. And it was perfect for him. Uh, so let's uh, indulge ourselves, shall we? Uh, it finished Manchester City 4, Liverpool 0. Um, but it meant so much more than just that. Take a look. Sterling, he's done well Sterling, and that is a penalty, 25th minute of the game, and Kevin De Bruyne tucks it into the net, and City lead, Kevin De Bruyne is becoming City's Mr Reliable from the spot, now a chance for City on the counter attack here, Phil Foden, Sterling, and still it's two. Raheem Sterling. Foden, Gundogan, Foden. This works beautifully. Foden makes it three. What a half for the Blues. And here's De Bruyne. It's a brilliant ball, Sterling, 4-0. City in dreamland, Liverpool enduring a nightmare. What a game this has been for City. Well, time almost up, but uh, City looking for more, and they have more. Riyad Mahrez makes it five, and that is an extraordinary night's work. Oh, hang on, hang on, I think it touches the arm, and it will not stand. Well, well, well. Well, that's the end of the game anyway.
So it might have been five. It was, in fact, four. It's already been five against Liverpool prior, but um, an extraordinary night um, here at the Etihad Stadium on Thursday. And there was so much talk about the significance of that result, not just because of what happened before, but what might indeed follow. But, Paul, I just wonder, there is so much of a gap between now and early, at least maybe mid-September, that the Premier League resumes. Was that actually more about what Manchester City can now offer for the rest of this campaign? Not necessarily for the Premier League, there is still that 20-point gap, but the knockout competitions that are to come. And Pep Guardiola afterwards saying, this tells us what we can do in those games against Arsenal and then Real Madrid. Yeah, but I think that deep down that the players and Pep wanted to put one over in Liverpool going into next season. Um, you know, Michael will tell you, we've been there ourselves, you know, games towards the end of the season that might be meaningless. You want to put your marker down for the next season. That the players want to show Pep that they're ready, and they wanted to show Liverpool how good they were as well. You know, the first 20 minutes were crazy. We were talking before we came on air. It could have been three, four, four all. You know, it was just like you attack, we attack, and then once Man City and Kevin De Bruyne and Phil Foden especially got a grip of the game, and there was only going to be one winner. And look, Liverpool obviously. Um, had just won the league and they did look as if they did enjoy themselves for a few days before it but as the Man City players you've got to go out there and they wanted to show Liverpool who was the best um, and then that was the thing I liked about it the most. Yeah the, the first 20 minutes was indeed pretty chaotic but if you like Michael when Kevin De Bruyne scored that penalty and it was won by Sterling with that beautiful piece of control and turn but this this penalty and you can see it from all sorts of true view angles here and we're not really here but the, this was the moment I think where that chaos subsided a little bit and City's attack which is superior to Liverpool's really started to dominate Liverpool's defence, which really is superior to City's. Well, that's what it was. Once you score the goal, you take that lead, your confidence is high. And I, and I, think, I think it was important in the game. Liverpool had have sort of gone, oh, here we go. And I just look back to the, the guard of honour. You know, as you're coming out, I'd be stood there as a player, not wanting to look. Thinking, be raging. You'd be just absolutely thinking, raging. I am, can't wait for this game to start. And I could see some of the players. If you have a look at it closely, you'll see some of them not really wanting to look. Appreciated and you know, did the right thing, sportsmanship like. But then you know, as soon as we cross this line, we're going to show you. And they did that, and it was it was a fantastic response. And like you say, Kevin De Bruyne now stepping up, having confidence for these penalties. That's the difference now, as they start to take the lead, and and from then on, it just stepped up another level. Uh, well Let's uh, show you 2-0 because um, this was, I think, at the moment when, when Raheem Sterling, who uh, and there are lots of subplots involving Joe Gomez and Raheem Sterling that you know about from the first time these two met and then the subsequent England uh, meet-up. But uh, I think this is the moment where Raheem Sterling, who has not scored, I don't think, against Liverpool until this moment, he really started, didn't he, Paul, to show, and whether it was inspired by any sort of other things that happened off the field in the England camps, he really started to show, didn't he, that it... The context didn't necessarily matter to him because the game mattered to him. It did, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the, the the one that he wanted to show Joe Gomez, um, who was the boss. Uh, absolutely that, fine. One hundred percent. I'll, you know, I'll be pragmatic about it. it, it you can dive right in there. And, and, <laughs> and Phil Foden's gave him the ball there. You know, he's he's actually sent him for a pie. <laughs> you know, he's he's went one way as, as he's come in and done it. But Raheem had the, the bit between his teeth. He wanted to show. Maybe not just not Joe Gomez, but. And the Liverpool fans and what happened with England it hurt him a little bit and he wanted to show he was the best that night and, and he done it. It was it was fantastic. And I was gutted he didn't get credit for the for the second goal, you know, being a next forward, you you want to see that and going to Raheem as well. But he was fantastic. I was slightly surprised he did get man of the match because I thought um, Kevin De Bruyne was was way ahead of anybody else in the pitch that night. You know, the Liverpool midfield well know they're energetic, um, they like to press, but they couldn't get anywhere near Kevin, you know. And, he knew what he was doing before he was getting the ball. His movement was fantastic. He was his energy was there, and it just gets better all the time, you know. And I don't think I can ever remember him just saying that Kevin De Bruyne has had a bad game. You know, if he gets a seven out of ten, you think something's wrong with him. Yeah, you see him be frustrated that he's only putting in a 7 out of 10. You're right, the, the, the Kevin De Bruyne kind of axis, if you like, with those around him is so important, but he rules that, doesn't he? runs that, and even when he's got Phil Foden alongside him, he, he almost elevates the play of somebody like Phil Foden. We saw that on Thursday night as well. I think he knows he is the top man in that dressing room for me now. He's running the show. Everything goes through Kevin De Bruyne. He's got that confidence. He's a player who knows it. You could see. And those little areas, and you talk where they hurt Liverpool, you see just inside of the fullbacks. The both fullbacks didn't know whether to come or go because it was just the perfect setup. When the build up play was on, 
Then you see Robertson didn't know whether to go because it was too far away. So Manchester City got it spot on. Little given goals, round the corners, little one-twos, and that's where they really hurt this Liverpool side. But the, the, the midfield, and we'll show you 4-0 as well, because pretty much every goal that we saw on Thursday night was an opportunity to kind of accentuate these points. When Manchester City have space in which to operate, which, of course, they did do, and uh, you, Paul, you're, you're right, it was going to go wide, so it was an own goal from Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, even though you would have you would have claimed it. But I was claiming that all day. Long. We've got replays, unfortunately. <laughs> you want to take a step back from just VAR? We've got okay. replays to show that that's not true. But when there's space to operate in, which Liverpool gave City on Thursday night, there is, it's, it's almost too dangerous for words because somebody like Kevin De Bruyne will find the right pass. You're right, Paul. He knows where it's going before it's even reached him, let alone where it's going to be passed to. And players like Raheem Sterling just must love the space that they don't often get. Well, they do, but you've got to earn it because generally against Liverpool, they don't have those spaces. So it was only because Manchester City was so good at it, the game opened up, they got the lead, so then Liverpool had to come out, had to try and get a reaction, which made it even better for City to actually get in and around it. And then you've seen one-on-one -on -one when people are travelling, and you often see City coming inside, but when you've got one-on-one -on -one and there's no cover... That's when the wide players are really going, yes, please, I can get in the area. It's interesting that you're at the Sheffield United game because we're going to show you what should have been, what might have been 5-0 because it happened really strangely in both games that happened on Thursday. It's in incredible that it happened both so, times. Huh? Were you, I would imagine you were in that Sheffield United-Tottenham game saying, hang on a minute. Really? And were you thinking the same thing here? Well, we were thinking exactly the same thing because you, d you just thought it was a definite goal from Harry Kane uh, uh, you know, in, the, in the outset to it. And then all of a sudden thinking something's wrong. I was with Alan Green commentator, who's not got the best eyes, Alan, he'll tell you himself. And we're saying VAR on the situation. And I had to react and say what I believed was correct. And ultimately, we don't like the rule. We don't think the rule's right. We've lost two goals on a, on a night of good football, but ultimately the officials and VAR got them right. Uh, yeah, they got them right. It's the rule that you might have a problem with because if there's any sort of intervention from a hand leading to a goal, regardless of the intention of the player, whether they was, uh, as in the show, well. fouled, Lucas Moura was on that occasion. It's annoying, isn't it? But you've got to speak to FIFA and IFAB and ask them to change the laws. Annoying's one way to put it. I put it slightly differently <laughs> the other night there, but I can't We're repeat that now. We're broadcasting, yes, quite Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Um, but look, Michael's right. As much as I want to disagree with it, it's... It's the law, you know, it's the rules of the law. Far, you have to say you got it right. But the rule for me itself is ridiculous, you know. Lucas Mora has three people trying to pull him down and kick him and he falls and the ball hits his arm. How can that be handball? And the same with Mares there, you know, he's, um, the ball's hit Phil, I think it is, in the arm yeah, as well, he's running Fabinho's through. Yeah, dragging him down. Yeah, he's so getting it's... pulled down at the same time. So if they're going to give the, ha the handball for that, give the foul in the first place and then we're not sitting arguing about it. But... And another uh, but, goal would have been but, fantastic, wouldn't it, Paul? Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> no. I just wanted five, six, and seven the other <laughs> night. There, four, four is 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 you know a, a heavy defeat, but five, I think you you term it as a thrashing, don't you? The difference between four and five is significant. Let's go to Natalie, who has her own recollections of Thursday night. And Natalie, I think uh, you can speak on behalf of all fans to say from that moment onwards, where Bernardo Silva decided to have a cup of tea, it was a rather interesting night. Yes. Bernardo Silva is my absolute <laughs> and utter hero and we better have a mug soon with his face on the side of it. Um, for me, Thursday night was a bit bizarre because, believe it or not, everybody, I missed the entire first half. Um, so, yes, I, I hope there is a collective groan out there. My poorly son had an operation on Monday and didn't want to go to bed, so Mummy took the first half and Daddy took the second half, so obviously Daddy got all of the goals. Um, but I wish that that was all, three of three of the goals. Um, the, I think the fifth goal, though, is really frustrating. Obviously, as fans as well, we want to see goals um, for me as well Phil Foden is pulled down there so I agree with Paul you want to see fair enough give, in, give the handball but you want to see the referee pull that back you want to see a free kick you want to see a yellow card there as well but it's definitely um, an issue with the rule but I just think it was an absolute and utter statement of intent from us on Thursday that was us going out there to say okay Liverpool you caught us on a season where we've been inconsistent for uh, uh, most of it um, but this is how good we are and if you want to keep challenging for things you've got to be able to match us next season and of course we're still in the FA Cup we're still in the Champions League we've still got a chance of winning a treble this season and that's going to completely outshine everything they've done if we get to it um, now I'd love to know as well of course what you think as well everybody um, we, we love getting your tweets we love getting your messages so please get onto social media and share your thoughts about Thursday night about tonight's game and about obviously what you're looking forward to for the rest of the season 
watching as well. My particular favourites are always when you show us your setup. So how are you watching? What have you got behind you? How have you set your living room up or your garden or where are you? So get onto social media and use hashtag WNRH. We love seeing them and we've got absolutely loads of tweets coming through right now as well. So thank you so much to everybody for those. Um, so yes, please do get in contact with us now. Uh, Natalie, thank you very much indeed. We're going to move on to um, a player who wasn't involved on Thursday night, and significantly so, because uh, he is a player who has left Manchester City um, a year left on his contract, Leroy Sané, of course, he's left Manchester City to go to Bayern Munich and decided as a result to not appear for Manchester City for the rest of the season. He can't play for Bayern in the Champions League, but he has left. He wasn't there. And of course, he was significant in a couple of occasions against Liverpool in the recent past as well. So I'm going to start with uh, Natalie on this one. And uh, Natalie, sad to see him go, I know, because he does offer something unique for Manchester City. But there is a sense, isn't there, from him personally that he wanted to, to move on and wanted to go back to, of course, the country of his birth. Yeah, of course, we're really sad to see him go. He had that phenomenal season, especially in 17-18, when he was such a huge part of the Centurions. Of course, he won the PFA Young Player of the Year Award that year as well. But you, we know, we've, we've heard it repeatedly now, you know, for young kids growing up in Germany, they want to play for Bayern Munich. You know, he's going to get to go home. He's going to get to challenge, um, hopefully, for a place in the German squad for the up-and-coming Euros. Um, you know, and, and you know, you've got to just remember how phenomenal he was for us. Um, and although we might not, as fans, we might be really disappointed that he's decided not to stay with us. We might be a little bit hurt that he's decided not to stay with us. We have to wish him well and we have to enjoy watching some of these incredible goals that we're seeing on the screen now. And we have to be really thankful that we got to see him for those years that we did and wish him well. And Natalie, thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes, Leroy Sané, uh, it's a deal which uh, could cost Bayern around £55 uh, million. Pounds. It's on a hefty weekly wage as well at the Allianz Arena. He's a player because Manchester City wants to, to, to find those young talents, Paul, and develop them and then have them at the club for an, a number of years. And it was the recruitment policy that brought people like Leroy Sané and, and more besides to the club. It hasn't worked out in terms of the long term, but he certainly contributed for the years that he was here. Yeah, he was. He was outstanding. I think seven trophies in four years. Um, Natalie said there, PFA Young Player of the Year. And um, I think he'll admit as well, as, as good as he was for Manchester City, I think Manchester City was good for him as well. Um, I think the, the alarm bells were there last summer, you know, when Bayern showed their interest and, and made it quite public. And, you know, every young player in Germany, as Natalie said before, wants to play for Bayern Munich and he's got a young family. Um, and he obviously wanted to go back there, but I thought it was it was interesting for me the the reaction obviously from Pep and the players. It was obviously very popular. You know there was a few mumblings about that there'd been fallouts and his attitude wasn't right. I never seen that once, and you know all his teammates have come out and wished him all the best. So there's obviously a big bond there as well. Uh, well, let's see some of that, uh, shall we? The uh, Manchester City teammates have uh, taken the opportunity to say goodbye to a player in this rather strange circumstance of leaving at the end of the season what would normally be the end of the season, but of course uh, with his teammates still uh, with games to play. So here are some of the reactions of the Manchester City squad to their departing German. So they've been doing that very kindly across their social media channels. And we can have a little look now, a message from, from David Silver, um, directly to Leroy Sane. Now, you might want to get your tissues ready, everybody. I've enjoyed so much playing with you, Amigo. You're one of the most talented players I've seen. I am sure you will achieve everything you want in the future. Gabriel Jesus has said, all the best in your new challenge, bro. We're going to miss you. Good luck. Hashtag 19. Um, Fernandinho, good luck on your new journey, my bro. It was a pleasure to share incredible moments with you during these four years. Hashtag Insane. Love it, Fernandinho. Ilke Gundogan, Leroy. Oh, he's put, oh Ilke Gundogan's put such a brilliant picture up of, of, of him and, and Leroy as well. You've got to go on and have a little look at that if you've not seen it. Leroy, I'm wishing you all the best on your next chapter in Munich. You've always been more than just a teammate for me. We'll miss the time on and off the pitch. I hope you will find such a friendly neighbour in Munich like you've had in Manchester. See you soon, bro. And Kevin De Bruyne has put up again a beautiful picture picture of him and Sane hugging, which I presume is after one of the many goals that they've both scored. Good luck in Germany, bro. Sergio Aguero, good luck on your new chapter, lad. And another brilliant picture. Again, I'm guessing that's from after one of the goals that they've scored. Uh, Bernardo Silva has put up a picture of the two of them laughing. Um, 
Uh, we're going to miss this guy so much, Bernardo says. So many good moments and trophies that we've all shared together. And Amaric Laporte. Oh, Amaric Laporte, that's a Liverpool tweet. But that is also a, a very important tweet. Um, great team performance tonight. Congrats, boys. We totally agree. <laughs> Yeah, it feels like that was the best man speech at the wedding, wasn't it? Where you're reading all those people who couldn't quite make it to the wedding saying uh, good luck to everybody. Uh, pictures from St. Mary's where kickoff is just 20 minutes away. Nice and sunny on the south coast. Southampton against Manchester City and the Blues first game since that Liverpool match that Imerick Laporte was so happy to win. And Michael Brown, Paul Dickoff alongside Nat and I here on We're Not Really Here. And Michael, let's talk about Sané and what kind of a hole he might leave because yes City have a whole host of wide players but they don't have that player anymore who is left footed plays on the left hand side and goes on the outside so might that be I don't know priority number two three four or five I don't know how many priorities they have uh, in this transfer market You've asked me the question and told me all the good points, Stu. What have you left for that? Well, look, he goes you, down the outside, he's got me. pace, he's got power, and he's so direct, isn't he? And he's a wonderful player. And I just wondered how he hasn't worked out. I think this probably started him getting a little bit frustrated that he didn't play week in, week out. And I think he's still a young player starting to mature. And when another club wants to pay you considerable amounts of money, uh, that takes into account going back home, etc. So it starts to then go. And I think, hopefully, you know, he can go on and fulfill his potential because as times of that inconsistency which happens as a young player that hasn't always been there but as I say he's well liked in the dressing room he's going to be a miss and and can there be a replacement can Manchester City go down the outside because we've seen lots and lots now driving inside with the type of play they have so he was something different I think it was as a result of Benjamin Mendy joining the club, Paul, wasn't it, that he decided that he wanted Raheem Sterling on that left-hand side, did Pep, because he wanted Sterling to come in and create the space for Benjamin Mendy, which made it hard for Sané to play on that left-hand side if he wanted to have Benjamin Mendy in the team as well. And so it was almost like because of all the riches that Pep had at his disposal, he couldn't quite find a way of using Leroy Sané as much as he wanted to use or be used, if you like, which begs then the question, well, maybe he doesn't need that kind of a player and won't seek to replace him. I don't think it'll be number one in the list to, to replace him. I think um, what we've seen when Raheem moved over with Mendy going the outside is that Raheem would, would track back a lot more than, than what Leroy Sané would. You know, Leroy um, was fantastic going forward, unbelievable pace, as you said, wanted to go on the outside all the time, but probably one of his biggest faults was not getting back in to protect his fullback. And, you know, in a pep team, if you don't work hard and get back into your shape... Um, he's not going to play you. So I, th I think there was a big factor there. And um, obviously, from Leroy's point of view, the competition for places that are here, you know, the Phil's coming through now. Obviously, Raheem, Bernardo, um, Riyad Mahrez has been fantastic this season. So the competition for places was going to make it difficult after a long-term injury if it, to come back in and get regular football. And we'll probably find that Bayern Munich's probably promising that a lot well, more. Paul, do you think it is it like a, a work ethic type thing with Leroy Sané? Because he's got everything, hasn't he? Do you know, what is it, do you know, you think he's missing I just for him think to play week I, in, week out? I think he's, look, he, and he is a young player, and he, he's, he's a great lad, we've all said that, but I just think he switches off at times um, defensively, you know, and we all know how much Pep teams want, want to win the ball back very quickly, and you know, I think Leroy, when an attack breaks down, he had a tendency sometimes to maybe stand there and, and think, oh, so it's that concentration level there, it's concentration, the mentality as soon as it breaks down yeah. to, to get back in and defend for your team and you could see Pep getting frustrated sometimes with him when that was happening you know. Um, but he's, he's still got a long way to go to overcome his injury so maybe that was a factor of it as well, you know, he's been out for a long, long time and he's not really done a lot of game time either so it's, it's, going, to take him, it's going to take Leroy time to, to, to get back into itself uh, there's an element, isn't there, that, uh, well, Manchester City only got £55 million, pounds, or potentially £55 million pounds for a player who last year before he got injured, or in a normal transfer market, might have been more like 90, 100, or even uh, more than those three figures. But yes, you're right, with that slight kind of lack of knowledge about how he might recover from the injury, and he hadn't had an opportunity to play at all, just a couple of minutes uh, since coming back from uh, lockdown. But you do have to fear, Michael, for right-backs in Bundesliga next season, because they've got Alfonso Davis at left-back, haven't they? who is as fast as, if not faster than Leroy Sané, who's going to probably play on the left-hand side of a front three. <laughs> You're going to be running scared from that, let alone trying to tackle them or cover them. Well, you can see why they've wanted to sign him. He's got everything. So, say, pace and power these days in modern-day football is key. And um, I, I just... I just... I loved watching him play. And I just wish now that he can go and really have a full potential and, and be really a superstar. 
because that's he's got everything if he goes to do it. He's got just the potential down to, to, to be one of the top players in the world, not not yeah. just in that position, but. And the one thing is, he's got ridiculous pace with short teams. His left foot's like a wand at times, and he's he's a proper athlete as well. And he comes from good stock. I think we all know that, and, and you can tell. As we heard from uh, Pep Guardiola before the game, 10 years since David Silva uh, signed for Manchester City. He joined on the 1st of July 2010. He's got a little bit longer than what he might have expected his 10 years at Manchester City uh, to be as a result of this uh, lockdown and the restart. And Natalie uh, Pavlek, who is uh, keeping an eye on your social media posts, but also I wanted to ask you, Natalie, about those priorities in the transfer market because David Silva is departing. Yes, Manchester City have riches in that position. Leroy Sané has departed. Manchester City have riches in that position. And yet, do you sense that there might be a player or two who come in to fill the gaps that they, that they leave? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all aware that we're still missing that key partner from Lick Report. We we hope, and I still really, really hope that John Stones um, will become the player that we all hope he is, but we've never replaced Vincent Company in the sense of on or off the pitch. And I, I know that Micah Richards did an interview this week um, highlighting that, saying that we really need um, a, a leader to go next to Laporte. So I think that's going to be um, one of the key positions, well, the key position that we're looking to fill. Of course, we're being heavily linked um, with the centre-back from Napoli. Now, everyone knows my pronunciations are awful, so so I'm not even going to try. I'm going to throw it to you guys, and you, you're going to know who I'm talking about. Um, and he is being so incredibly highly rated, and we're, you know, we're, we're one of many teams that are being linked with him at the minute. Um, from the reviews that I've read about him from some of the games that I've seen of Napoli playing in the Champions League this year, he looks like an incredible player. He's, he's being you know, hailed up there alongside sort of Van Dijk in terms of talent this season. Um, so I'd be really interested to know as well what the guys think about him. And uh, go on, Paul, can you pronounce his name for me? Go on, just try, Natalie. Cal Cal Kulibay. Kulibay. Kalidou Kulibay. I'm the worst. Kalidou Kulibay. Just call him KK. I'm sure that's his nickname. Uh, but yeah, what, what do you think about that, Michael? Because yeah, it, it has been mooted that, that centre back is the number one priority. Well, I put my neck out in January and said that I thought Manchester City would sign him. So You're I think for them to do I, I, <laughs> just for your I reputation. I thought it was done. <laughs> so I don't know any more than that. It's just my hunch. Well, let's see, but obviously it'd be a, certainly a good addition for Manchester City. Uh, and right-footed as well, yeah. so look more left-footed, Koulibaly right-footed. Koulibaly for me is, uh, he would pro probably go against what the transfers that they've had before, because he's 29, nearly 30. I think if you look at the majority of Pep signing since he's come in, you know, Leroy, Bernardo Silva, Mendy, John Stones, um, you know, Gabriel Jesus, they were all sort of 20, 21, 22, 23, were the best years ahead of them. You know, and it's very rarely you see Pep or even there's a Barcelona or Bayern Munich signing a player of that age, but the guy's a beast. If you Paul, ever see him play, he's a Well, it was a good beast. point what Natalie said about John Stones, because only, you know, only before his run of injuries, he was incredible on the ball. You know, you've seen him take it, and, you know, how, how cool was he in the box? Remember the Liverpool game, taking it at Anfield under pressure? And, and that's what you want to bring John Stones back, a fit John Stones, confident. Hopefully he can be a real addition, but he's got to get himself right. It's get himself fit because he's, he's fit for four or five games and he looks as if he's getting back to that form again. Um, but then all of a sudden, you know, he'll pick up another niggly injury and he misses three or four games. And it's so difficult as a player, you know, you need that consistency in there, especially when Vincent's left and... You know, I'll go back to old school centre forwards when we used to play two up front. You need that partnership, and the centre half partnership is so important. And it's been difficult for Johns to keep fit and get any sort of partner for any, any amount of time now. Uh, and no coincidence when you look at the times that Manchester City have won the league, you look at the consistency of those two centre backs. It was Vincent Company and Jolie and Lescott, who we heard from, of course, uh, the other night on We're Not Really Here. And then it was Stones and Company two years ago. And then Otto Mendy had that run when Stones was injured in that uh, season, uh, last season as well. Uh, we'll come back to this conversation in just a moment and look ahead to our, our game, which is Southampton against Manchester City. A seven o'clock kickoff uh, on the sunny south coast. And Natalie has an opportunity to remind us of the two teams, Nat. Yes, thank you very much, Hugh. In case you are just joining us and you haven't seen any team news yet, we make six changes to the team that started and so convincingly beat Liverpool on Thursday night. Edison stays in goal, and then we have some changes at both left and right back. So you've got Cancelo and Zinchenko both coming into the team tonight. And then in the middle, you've got Laporte and Garcia, of course, who remain from the Liverpool game. Moving into midfield, and the exciting prospect for me tonight is that we think Fernandinho will be starting in that holding midfield position. In front of him in the middle, we're expecting to see both the Silva, so David Silva and 
Bernardo Silva, then Sterling out on the left, Mares comes back into the team out on the right, and Jesus up front. On the bench, we have Bravo, John Stones, Ilke Gundawan, Rodri, and it is a year to the day since we signed Rodri, so happy anniversary, Rodri. KDB, Nicholas Otamendi, Phil Foden, Tommy, jo Tommy Doyle and Taylor Harwood Bellis. Now, having a look over onto that Southampton team for tonight, um, in goal you have McCarthy, and then you have a back four, we think of Walker Peters, Bednarek, Stevens, and Bertrand, then Ward Prowse, Romeu, Armstrong, Redmond. And then Danny Ings and Shay Adams up front. So that is your Southampton team for tonight. A team, as I've already said, and I'm hoping I'm not jinxing us, has lost their last six Premier League meetings against City. Natalie, thank you very much indeed. Yes, we only have, what, about 10 minutes to go until kickoff. We'll be back here at half time for the thoughts of Michael Brown and Paul Dickov and Natalie Pavlek and then indeed after the match as well. Do keep all your social media interactions coming in. Uh, you know the hashtag WR. N H, which is more of a tongue twister than you would have ever imagined. We're not really here. Michael Brown, let's talk about um, just very briefly about the context in which Manchester City find themselves ahead of this game against Southampton. Pep Guardiola on Thursday night after the game talked about the fact that nobody, nobody in Europe would have got near Liverpool this season because of the way they were so consistent in the league. And all of Manchester City's inconsistency for some reason have happened in the league, whereas beforehand they've probably been more in the Champions League or, or in other cup competitions. How much has that Liverpool game taught Pep about his team and how much has it taught, that, taught him about what might be achievable for the Southampton game and beyond? I think it's taught him that they've still got the reaction, that hunger. He believes in his squad, so I've got, I don't doubt that. But I think it goes back to Liverpool's wonderful start. They win the first eight games, so the pressure was on. Manchester City started chasing a little bit, forcing games where you, you would normally have that patience and getting counter-attacked and losing them. And the injuries, that become a little bit of a worry at times, you know, especially defensively. So the inconsistency started to, to not be there. And, and confidence is key. You've just seen straight away we talk about confidence in Kevin De Bruyne. As soon as he's confident and playing well, it gets better and better for him. So... Hopefully that's increased confidence levels within the football club to go on now into the remainder of games and ultimately build up to, to Arsenal. Yes, it's, it's a big game tonight, but it's not essential. They'll want to do everything right, no injuries, and just try and move the ball around quickly, but build towards Real Madrid also. Um, I mentioned the context, Paul. It's, it's really strange, isn't it? Because City have lost their last two away games in the Premier League. Pep has never won three consecutive away games in his managerial career. Southampton, terrible at home. And so I'm, I'm kind of conscious of the fact that neither team have got particularly good uh, recent records in the situation they find themselves this evening. No, they're not. But look, you look at the Manchester City team and all the changes that they've got. It's still a, a top, top team that would beat most teams in Europe. And... But going back to what, what Michael was saying there and, and the question that you asked Michael is um, I think Pep will be more delighted with the hunger of his squad the other night there as well. You know, 3 0 at half time, it'd be so easy. How many times have we seen teams take their, their foot off the pedal? You know, the, once it got to 4 0, they wanted to make it 5 0 and really push themselves on. So it's not just top quality players we've got, there's a hunger within. Um, we all know Liverpool are champions, but the FA Cup coming up, they want to win that, and especially the Champions League. And the desire of the players to do that is going to be its very best now. I know it's still over a month away, well, a month and a half away, but that's fascinating. Should Manchester City get past Real Madrid, that fascinating knockout week of Champions League football will be something the likes of which, uh, even if we've enjoyed summer tournaments over the years, something the likes of which we have never seen before, and it's certainly worth uh, looking forward to. Certainly, if you're a Manchester City fan, you want to be very much a, a part of that. So what about tonight? We'll come to the panel in just a moment moment and get their predictions on Southampton against Manchester City in the Premier League. Yes, that strange situation of Southampton being safe and Manchester City really knowing where they're going to finish, but it's still brought all number of predictions from all over the world, including one particular citizen from Mumbai. Hello, I'm Sanam Jain. I'm a Manchester City fan from Mumbai, India. I started supporting Manchester City in the year 2008. When Manchester City broke the British transfer record for signing Rubinho. Manchester City played one of the most attractive and aggressive football in the league. My favourite current player in Manchester City is Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne needs no introduction. 
he is the most consistent player in the Premier League and one of the best players in world football. He's dipped over to the left hand side, Kevin De Bruyne tries to lay this one off, goal number two, Raheem Sterling. Kevin De Bruyne, the goal scorer turns provider. My favourite past player from Manchester City is Vincent Kompany. Vincent Kompany is our ex-captain, leader and legend. He was one of the most reliable players Manchester City ever had. The player who was for Southampton Football Club is Danny Ings. Danny Ings has been banging in goals left, right and centre for the Southampton Football Club. He is also in the race for uh, the Golden Boot. The player who will uh, make an impact for Manchester City in the game, according to me, is Phil Foden. Bill Fortin has been uh, playing some great football recently. Look at the way he's so precise, so firm and unerringly accurate. Whenever he's given a chance, uh, he's played really well. Match prediction, I think Manchester City should uh, win the game for them. Salam in Mumbai, thank you very much indeed. One of the millions of citizens all around the world looking forward to Southampton against Manchester City in the Premier League. Just about five minutes or so until we uh, leave you in the uh, hands of the commentary team all over the world, whoever you are getting your coverage from. And if you're watching on the Manchester City app, don't forget Alistair Mann will take you through uh, the game with Manchester City's own commentary as well. We're back at half-time and then full-time with Michael Brown and Paul Dickov and Natalie Pavlek alongside as well. So, Paul, there is a sense, isn't there, with everything, and you get this at the end of the season sometimes, with everything kind of done and dusted with these two teams in uh, where their kind of aspirations either lie or have been reached as far as Southampton and safety are concerned. Is there going to be a freedom that we see, a, a, lack, of, a lack of jeopardy almost about this match? I think Southampton have got to be very careful if, if they do go out and play with a bit of freedom. You know, they've already been done 9-0 once this season and if any team can do that to you again, it's, it's Manchester City. But um, for, from Manchester City's point of view, you know, the six changes tonight, and you know, obviously Cancelo, um, Alexander Zinchenko's came in, they'll be wanting to show Pep that they're ready with the big games that they've got coming up. I know we touched on the Real Madrid game and the Arsenal game in the FA Cup. So all the players that are, that are coming into the team I want you to make a marker um, to, to show the manager that they're ready, especially after the long layoff. And I want to ask you about Gabriel Jesus as well, because he is a player who offers so much for Manchester City, and, and yet his expectations are so high because of the guy that he often comes to replace. He is, and you know, I, I think he's, I think he's a top top player. And you know, I've said it for a couple of years now. I've never really understood the little bit of stick that he gets, but I think it's because he's constantly getting compared to Sergio Aguero, who's who's the GOAT, and he's the best um, that we've seen here. But uh, Gabby, for me, you know, when he was 19, 20, he was England's number nine. You've not, nothing about you um, or something about you if, if you're going to do that. And his goals to record, I keep saying it, his goals to games record is ridiculous. Uh, Michael, how pleased are you to see Fernandinho back in that holding midfield position? I'm pleased. I, I'd like him to play more. I know it's opportunities. He can't always get in there. He's covered. He showed you what type of unselfish player he is when he stepped and played so many games at central defence. And he's happy just to be playing football. Even at a slender age, he wants to play every every single minute. So it'll be great for him to go and you know show, show what he's got and the, the master back at work in uh, the holding midfield role. Uh, Natalie, Manchester City riding the crest of that wave uh, from uh, here at the Etihad on Thursday night. Do you think that will send them onto the... I'm going to try and think of some awful gag about the fact that they're on the south coast here, but it's probably not going to work. So what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think Thursday night was um, incredible for our confidence going into the rest of the season, of course, the rest of the Premier League games, and more importantly, the FA Cup, and then that Champions League mini tournament that you mentioned to you that is just going to be incredible. Of course, fingers crossed that we get past Real Madrid. So yes, I think the confidence will be sky high, um, and I think poor old Southampton. Uh, crashing on the waves of the Solent, which is next to St Mary's. It's a geographical thing. Uh, Natalie, give us a very quick score prediction. I'm thinking you know, 3 or 4, 1 to see. 3 or 4, 1, Michael? 3 nil for me. 3 nil for you? 4 nil. 4 nil for Paul Dickov, who, if you know Paul Dickov, is the most confident man you're ever likely to meet. So enjoy the commentary wherever you are around the world. If you'd like to stay on the Manchester City app, you'll be able to follow Alistair Mann's commentary from St Mary's. It's Southampton against the, uh, the Premier League champions who have just been deposed, and yet next season could well be something special.